today. Open up your Bibles to Titus chapter 2 today. We will continue our study in the epistle Titus. If you're not sure what an epistle is, it's a letter. So why we don't just call it a letter, I don't know. It's probably a Greek word somewhere. This was a letter Paul wrote to Titus on the island of Crete. An interesting place indeed. Titus chapter 2. I'm going to be reading to you out of the New Living again today. We're only going to be able to study half of chapter 2 because when I practiced the entire chapter 2, it took way too long. So we're going to do half of it today and another half next week. And uh, I was wrong. There are only three chapters in Titus. You'd think, having done a textual study over it, I'd know how many chapters were in it. But I got home last week and Kara's like, there's only three chapters in Titus. There's, there's not four. So, But we're going to take four weeks anyway because we're splitting this one in two. I don't think we'll have to split chapter 3 and 2, so we should just, four weeks should be good. All right, let me read the entire section. We're just going to be doing verses 1 through 6 today. Verse 1, but as for you, talking to Timothy, excuse me, Titus, but as for you, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have strong faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live a way that is appropriate for someone serving the Lord. They must not go around speaking evil of others and must not be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to take care of their homes and to do good and be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage young men to live wisely in all they do. We're going to stop there. Okay, That's what we're studying today. Just to recap, this letter was written to Titus, who is establishing a church on Crete. Crete was not a very uh, moral place. It was a very immoral place. It was a place where people loved to drink and party, and where there was rampant sexuality, uh, violence of every kind. It was not a calm place to live, and it was certainly not a godly place to live. And in this place, Paul shoves Titus. Gotta feel sorry for Titus, you know? I mean, he didn't go to Hoxie, Kansas. He went to Las Vegas, (laughs) you know? And he had to plant a church there. Not only was he in charge of planting a church, he was in charge of establishing elders. Now, you can't just establish an elder. You have to build up an elder because everyone there started from scratch. Everyone there was a baby Christian. And so Titus's job was to build up individuals, establish them as elders so that the church can take care of itself. Now, chapter 1, Paul discussed with Titus how to, you know, what an elder should be like, and he discussed the gospel. But then he says in chapter 2, but as for you. Now, that but is a contradiction of what he said at the end of chapter 1, and that was that there are people out there that won't listen to right teaching. But you... As for you, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. Literally, in the Greek, it says, speak things that become good doctrine. That's the King James translation. Speak things that become good doctrine. The word become there means to be appropriate for. So, like, you know, if I would say that's unbecoming of a gentleman. He's saying, live in a way that's becoming of good doctrine. Good doctrine promotes right living. But I think I should point out that good good doctrine is not necessarily right living itself. For example, I can say, love your neighbor as yourself. That's right doctrine. That's sound, good, solid doctrine. But it's lived out in lots of different ways. That's what he should be promoting. Right living or living that is appropriate for someone who has right doctrine. Now, why would that be such a big deal? Because he's on Crete, (laughs) where no one knows what it means to live rightly. You know, uh, I was, uh, uh, Kay gave me a book not too long ago. Uh, Oh, Simbala, do I have that right? What's his first name? Oh, it's Zimbala. Oh, Jim Zimbala. He was the founder of the Brooklyn Tabernacle, which I'm assuming is in Brooklyn. And uh, he, uh, this is the story of how that church got started. And he tells stories of individuals that came to their congregation from some of the worst aspects of living you can imagine. I mean, 
gangs, homosexuality, prostitution, uh, domestic violence, uh, I mean, swingers, everything. I mean, it doesn't matter if there was sin out there, the people that committed those sins ended up somehow in his church. He was living in a place where people simply didn't know what right and wrong were. Now, they had a conscience, but their consciences had often been seared by years of sin. And so they had to start from scratch. I remember there was one gentleman who was a male prostitute that, that got saved. And uh, he tells the story of how, how they had to teach him how to be a man. You know, he had never been taught how to be a man. He had always been a woman, if you will. And it was silly things like how to cross your legs at the, at the ankle instead of like this. Now, that's actually an American thing. In England, they always cross their legs the other way. But, I mean, simple thing, how to, how to converse with another man, how to treat other men and so on and so forth, because he had never learned that. That's who Titus is dealing with here, people who simply don't have a clue how to live rightly. And so he says, Titus, speak things that become right teaching. Speak things that become good doctrine. In other words, <coughs> let's hope that doesn't happen again. In other words, as they say in the New Living, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. And then he gives some examples. Verse 2. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect and to live wisely. They must have strong faith and be filled with love and patience. Now, the word there for older men is presbutes. Presbutes uh, is not presbuteros, which is an elder. You remember that uh, Titus was supposed to establish elders? That's presbuteros. This literally means an older man. Uh, so this is just anyone who's older. Some of you are thinking, well, I'm not old. Well, you know, it depends on how you, it depends on how you, are you older than me? I don't know. Uh, but he's talking to the older men here. And they are supposed to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, and wise in action according to New Living. In the Greek, or excuse me, in the King James, it says temperate, grave, and sober. Temperate, grave, and sober. Temperate would be like, uh, so I think I have these, I had them backwards. Temperate would be self-controlled. Someone who is in control of themselves. I love to tell young men who are trying to become a man, most people think that being a man means controlling, being able to control other people, whether it's by physical brute force or by your wiles or whatever. But being a real man is about controlling yourself. That's much harder than controlling other people. And so when we as men are self-controlled, we decide what we're going to do, not ourselves. Does that make sense? I decide what I'm going to do. I don't let my flesh decide what it's going to do. I get angry, but I don't speak. I am tempted, but I do not chase after the temptation. I am upset, but I control my emotions, because I am self-controlled. That's what older men are supposed to be. It also says worthy of respect. If you are an individual who is... <coughs> Sorry, if you are an individual who is self-controlled, you will be worthy of respect. People around you will recognize your ability to control yourself. It may take time, but eventually you will be worthy of respect. The word there in, in the King James is grave. Uh, we think of grave as in dead, uh, but literally what they mean by grave is someone who is serious to the point that others recognize it. Say, that person is serious. Anybody know a goofball? Don't look at me. Yeah. Anybody a goofball? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I had a, a friend in school who was a complete goofball. We were really close friends, but, uh, and I realized one day he didn't know how to be serious. I mean, this kid simply did not, because he, he did something that hurt my feelings, and I wanted to talk to him about it and say, look, can we not do this anymore? And he just goofed and laughed and went on about his merry way, had no idea how to be serious. That person's not worthy of respect, because they're not grave. They're certainly not trustworthy. So we are supposed to be worthy of respect. We're supposed to be grave. The last one is sober. Now, when we think sober, we think someone who is not drunk. But that's not what the word originally means. Uh, in, in Old English, sober was something else. It had nothing to do with alcohol. Now, you applied it to someone who was drunk. They're not sober. But it was because someone who is sober is someone who is 
uh, wise in what they do. And if anyone's ever watched drunks, they're not wise in what they do. I was a party DJ for four years. I can attest that drunk people simply are not wise. And they're really funny to watch. Until they get mad. Until they get mad, then they're not fun to watch anymore. But, uh, but we are supposed to be wise in our actions. Uh, let me give you one other word that might help you understand this. Um, intentional. A sober person is intentional. They do things on purpose. You see, we often are led by what we think or feel at the moment. But a wise person, someone who is sober, is someone who thinks about what they're going to do. And they do things on purpose. You know, I can raise my kids by just letting them grow up. But I can be intentional in how I raise them. And they can grow up better. I can pastor this church by just letting things happen and dealing with them as they come. Or I can be intentional in how I make my decisions the words that I choose, the cho- the actions that I decide to take. We're also supposed to be strong in faith, love, and patience. Now, why is it so important for older men to be like this? Now, in our culture, we have a unique aspect that is new to history, as far as I've been able to discover. We are the first culture that venerates youth. We love being young. You like being young, Shane? Shane likes it. Shane's like, I'm not young. Yeah, whatever. Enjoy it. <laughs> we, don't, we don't like getting older. And it's not just that our body doesn't function as well as it used to. I mean, how, how much money you spend every year in America on creams to make your face less wrinkly? For the women, the guys are like, none. How much money is spent on hair dye to prevent the gray from showing? How much money is spent on exercising to to keep that flab away so that we can still look young? Our culture venerates youth and ignores those of advanced years. That is opposite of almost every culture in history. You see, when someone gets older, they have experienced things that younger people haven't experienced. You know, I remember talking to my father one day about being a pastor because he was a pastor for several years. And he said something that I didn't agree with. I thought, no, it's not going to be like that. And I didn't pay attention to him. And I paid for it. I should have listened to him because he had experience I didn't have. Sorry. <clears throat> those of us who, and I say us because I'm older than some of you, but older men are supposed to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, wise in action, strong in faith, love, and patience because we are supposed to be an example to those who are younger than us. I first learned this when I became a parent. I knew that my children were going to copy my behavior. And so I decided then and there, I need to change my behavior. If someone's going to be copying me, I need to be intentional in how I behave. When I became a teacher, the same thing happened. I realized that these students were going to mimic me. They were going to take on my attitudes about things, and so I needed to have a positive attitude. I needed to do things that built others up instead of tear them down. I needed to deal with crisis. I needed to to deal with conflict. I needed to deal with money or with outreach or with participation in a way that they should be able to mimic. So older men, we need to deal with things in a manner that others can copy, not in the way we want, because those two are often not the same thing. When you have an opportunity to deal with crisis in front of someone else, take advantage of it. They can see how you do it. You know, a lot of parents never argue in front of their children. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but I make it a point that if it is a discussion that my wife and I can resolve in front of the kids, that we do. Otherwise, how are they going to learn how to resolve conflict? I don't want them learning it at school. (laughs) They're not going to learn it right there. Now, there are discussions we can't have in front of them. I have to be intentional. 
But what about the younger men in the congregation? What about the younger men in this community? How do they see us as older men, or how do I see you as older men, because I'm, I'm not that old. How do you handle the things that life throws you? Because like it or not, you are an example, whether you want to be or not. You may say, well, I'm not an elder in a church. I'm just a member. You're still a Christian. That makes you an example. Older women. Let's go to verse 3. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that is appropriate for someone serving the Lord. They must not go around speaking evil of others and must not be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women too, and then we're going to stop there. Okay, because it talks about younger women after that. All right. The word for older women is presbytes. It is the female version of the word before, which was presbytes. Uh, it, it just means an older woman. In the King James, it translated, it's translated aged women. <laughs> I like the New Living's translation. It's a little nicer. Just older women, you know, not old women. Because of context, we can assume that he is talking about women whose children are either older or grown up and moved away because he talks about the younger women as having kids. So let's, let's read about, about the presbytes and how they should behave. They should live in a way that is appropriate for someone serving the Lord. The, the word there is they should live in a way that becomes holiness. A way that is appropriate for holiness. My daughters have a video, a Barbie video, called Barbie Princess Charm School. Do I have that right? Where they, these girls go to a school to learn how to be a princess. They learn how to be, how it, you know, what's appropriate for a princess to be. There's also a movie out there uh, called The Princess Diaries where a young woman finds out she's a princess and she has to be trained how to behave like a princess because she's a tomboy. And it's a very entertaining film. But, you know, as, as individuals, all of us should be like this. We should live in a way that becomes holiness. You see, you're holy if you're a believer. Jesus made you holy. You are righteous in Christ. But you are supposed to live in a way that becomes that. You are supposed to live a life that is appropriate for a holy person. Ministers are often held to a higher standard as how we are supposed to live. Our children are often held to a higher standard. Our behaviors are often scrutinized more, and I'm not saying anything against that. The Bible says we are, as teachers, to be held to a higher standard. That's fine. But see, the problem is, is that we hold ministers to a higher standard, and we don't hold anybody else to a standard. If you're holy, you should live in a way that becomes holiness, a way that is appropriate for a holy person to behave. Now, what are the details he discusses here? They must not go around speaking evil of others. Now, why would he include that in instructions to older women? Or was that too sexist of a comment? Who said no? <laughs> Tim did. Guess. <laughs> it's not always Tim. It's not always Tim. I noticed it wasn't a female. Um, now, gossip is not something that only older women do. I know that, okay? Okay. But it is common, one of the reasons is because their time is no longer filled up with children. And that is a lot of it. You know, younger women who have kids have a lot less time to talk with each other. But whatever the reason he specifies this for older women, I think that we need to, just like we do the older men, not isolate it to just them. This needs to go for all of us. We need to not go around speaking evil of each other. Now, why is that bad? Well, we've already talked about gossip several times. In fact, I have a couple of sermons on audio uh, CD in the library that talk about that in detail. But let me just put this in context. We are supposed to live in a way that becomes holiness. You can't talk evil about someone without having a bad attitude towards them. Having a bad attitude towards someone, <coughs> excuse me, towards someone does not become holiness. And I don't care who they are. They could be your worst enemy. But having a bad attitude towards them does not become a holy person. What is Jesus' attitude towards you? It's good. 
Always. He loves you. He's excited about you. He cares about your life. And that's a holy attitude. The reason we're not supposed to go around talking evil about others is because we're not supposed to be feeling evil about others. We are supposed to say only things that build each other up. When we complain or gripe or discuss other people, we are gossiping and we are not living in a way that becomes a holy person. And then he mentions heavy drinkers. They should not be a heavy drinker. Now why would he mention that again? Remember, this is Crete. Everybody's a heavy drinker. <laughs> okay? It's just part of their culture. And he's saying, look, we need to not live that way because we need to be in control of ourselves. Now, this last part here, verse 4, the beginning of verse 4, the older women must train the younger women too, and then he gives some instruction to the younger women. Why would he ask the older women to instruct the younger women? Probably because they've been there. They've done that. Older women have experienced raising their children through all the various stages. They've experienced life in its fullness, if you will. And they have the wisdom to be able to train the younger women. But let me say this. Training younger women is an older woman's responsibility, not her right. Let me explain what I mean by that, because you may think, well, what's the difference? If you look at teaching younger women how to be a better woman as your right, you'll go about it all wrong. But if you look at it as your responsibility, you'll deal with it different. Let me put it to you this way. This is not about telling younger women how to behave. This is about them asking you how to behave. My pastor always says you can't answer an unasked question. If somebody doesn't ask you what's wrong with them or ask you how to fix what's wrong with them, you can't answer that question because they won't receive it. Older women should not try to force their opinions on younger women, but they should be available. And of course, for those of you who don't want to do it because you, well, I don't know enough or I don't have enough experience or I don't have the time, let me ask you this. If you experienced pain in your life and suffering in your life, which we all have, why waste it on just yourself when you can help somebody else learn from it? Why else did you suffer if not to benefit somebody else? Now, the older women are supposed to train the younger women too. So let's go to verse, what was that, verse... Second part of four, the older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and children. Uh, let's finish it. To live wisely and be pure, to take care of their homes, to do good and to be submissive to their husbands, then they will not bring shame on the word of God. Now, the young women there is nehot nehoteros, which just means a young person. The gender is actually implied by the context. But they are supposed to first love their husbands. The word is phil philandros which means to be affectionate with your husband. So young ladies, you're supposed to be affectionate with your husband. Now notice what's second, love their children. It would be very easy for us to assume that that order is accidental. It is not. Loving your husband comes before loving your children. Sorry kids. Why is that so important? Because if you put your children before your husband, your children will suffer for it. There was a, a, a saying on uh, um, Family Life Today, the best, way to, the best way to love your children is to love your husband. Because if you love your husband properly, the kids will have a better father, for one. Then they will have the safety of knowing that the relationship between the two of you is good. And they will grow up knowing that they are not the center of the universe. A real problem among our modern generations. Our children think that they are what's most important. And they're not. A good way to train them that is to show them that someone else in your family comes before them. Now hopefully your husband won't think he's the center of the universe. <laughs> I suppose that is a, a, a danger to this. But I think even more important than that, your children will grow up knowing how to have a good marriage. Your children will be children in your home for only a little while, but they'll be married for a long time. More important that they know how to be married than how to be children. 
Now, what else are young women supposed to do? They're supposed to live wisely and be pure, take care of their homes, do good, and be submissive to their husbands. Now, there have been many people that have latched onto that and said they're supposed to take care of their homes and, be, and submit to their husbands. Therefore, they should remain at home and, as the feminists would say, be barefoot and pregnant. Is there a kitchen in that? I, I thought barefoot and pregnant was... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Let me tell you a little story. When, when our kids were younger, I remember telling Kara she had to go get a job. Now, she wanted one, but I told her she had to go find one. Something part-time. And so she went and worked at the Good Book Store in Hayes one day a week, except for the Christmas season. <laughs> I always needed her more then. Now, why did I do that? We didn't need the money. Actually, we did at that time, didn't we? <laughs> I don't remember. Anyway, it wasn't because of the money. It was because Kara needs time away from children. She's not a kid person like some women are. And she was going insane at the house. In order to take care of her home, she needed to leave it for a little while. Now, some women aren't like that. Some women, if you take them out of the home, they do poorly. It is up to the husband and wife to decide how best to take care of the home and to submit to their husband because she submitted to me by going to get a job. She didn't, she was, she wanted to, but she was concerned about, you know, Kai was, he was pretty little at the time. She's like, I don't know if I want to leave my kids alone. They're, they're young, they're impressionable. I need to be with them all the time. <laughs> and I said, they need to be with you when you're sane. They don't, I, I had a student who had a mother who was clinically ill. Clinically, not clinically ill, she was clinically mentally ill. And uh, that's not a situation you want any child to be in. So I sent her off. So I don't want you to think that because you submit to your husbands and that you will take care of your home, that means barefoot and pregnant. It just means you need to make sure that it's your responsibility that the home is taken care of. Now, I do a lot of chores in my house. I help take care of a lot of things. It doesn't matter what you do, but it is Kara's responsibility to make sure our home is in good shape. Not necessarily physically, but emotionally. Now, I'm still the leader of our house. I still, you know, have the authority, but I listen to her because she knows better than I do about how to, you know, how to take care of the children. <laughs> I let her do the books, too, but that's because I don't want to go bankrupt. That's a whole other story. So that's the young women. Now, young guys, we get off easy. Verse 6. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely in all they do. See, that's just one thing. You know, everyone else, they got all these long lists of things that they're supposed to do. Young men, all we have to do is live wisely in everything. <laughs> Why would he say young men live wisely? Maybe it's because young men don't live very wisely. I mean, what, what are you going to do this afternoon, Jared? <laughs> now I'm not making fun of Jared that's right I'm not, I'm not making fun of Jared because if I felt any better I'd be right there with him but Jared's going to go play paintball this afternoon that is complete foolishness he's going to go out there and let someone shoot a paintball at him at 300 feet per second and, and it hurts and you're out there running you, and he's going to be in the woods this time so you're tripping and falling all kinds of stuff is that wise? <laughs> I would say yes, but that's just because I like to do it. I'm not saying that we have to be serious in everything we do. I'm all for having fun. But we need to be wise or intentional. It's that word sober again. We need to make sure that what we decide we're going to do, we decide on purpose. We don't decide just because we want to do it. We decide because we know it's what's best. Is it good for Jared to get out and play paintball? Yeah, I think so. He works very hard. He needs some time out there with the guys being out and, and, you know, doing something physical. I could use it too, but unfortunately, if I went out there, I wouldn't last five minutes. I'd fall apart coughing. But the young men don't live wisely naturally. And yet we're supposed to. When something comes across our path that angers us, we need to control it. When something happens to us that disappoints us, we need to stand firm and have faith. When our children annoy us, we need to be loving and kind and generous and forgiving. It doesn't come naturally to us, but that's what we should do because it becomes our righteousness. 
Allow me to rephrase that. It is appropriate for someone who is righteous. This is Paul's instructions to the people of Crete. Let it be instructions for you as well. That as life comes at you, come back at it with righteousness, with holiness. Let the Bible speak to you ways that become righteousness. Be intentional in how you live. Be a stable example for those that are younger than you. Because there's always somebody younger than you. And whether you are an old man, an old woman, a young woman, or a young man, live soberly, intentionally, and obey God's commands for you. Amen? Amen. Why don't we close with a word of prayer? Father, I thank you for your word that instructs us how to live. I thank you, Father, that through your word you give us wisdom. Now we can know what becomes right teaching and good doctrine. Lord, help us to, as Harold said, to take time every day to know it, to learn it, so that we can put it inside of our hearts, and we can bury it deep down inside so that it can sprout and grow and produce good fruit. Father, help us as a congregation to be examples for those around us, not just in the congregation, but outside as well, that they could see our right living, that we would not bring shame to the gospel, but rather to bring uh, your love to other people, that they could see us loving one another the way you love us. Thank you, Father, that we can, through the power of the Spirit, live at peace and love with each other, that we can live a powerful, self-controlled life. Help us to tap into that and to take advantage of it. In Jesus' name, amen.